Well, we've got some breaking news. We're all pretty much dying of cancer. At least the men are, but not to worry because before we get cancer in the next five or 10 years and inevitably die from it, according to the media, there's a new pandemic on its way. M pox, also known as monkey pox. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another video, everybody. Before we get into it, I do want to encourage everyone to smash the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. It does really help grow the channel. Wow, it is good to be back. And for those that did see the video that I posted uh, earlier today, I'm sorry, I had to take it down. It absolutely got suppressed. YouTube just doesn't like Donald Trump, which is why you should go over and follow me on X, which is linked down below in the description or the pinned comment below. And without further ado, Let's get into this video here. So we're starting off with the polls. Justin Trudeau is not looking very good, sitting at a measly 70 projected seats. Pierre Polyev, on the other hand, is looking pretty phenomenal. 214 projected seats, bottom line of 181, top end of 234. They still only need 172 for a majority government, so that is looking very good. 99% likely across the board for winning the most seats and for a majority government. So Pierre is doing a phenomenal job. What's not looking too good, though, is construction in Canada. So this is June 2024. These are the building permits per region. So Nunavut, congratulations. They went from one to a, a, a couple, <laughs> and they've gone up a 1,000%. Yay, good job, Nunavut. Everywhere else, the building permits are insanely down, right? BC, 23%. Ontario, 12.8%. Right? Saskatchewan, 20, almost 25%. Like, that is insane, folks. And this is why we're having a massive crisis here. It's what's contributing to the massive crisis in Canada is there's nowhere to house people. There are not enough rooms for people to sleep in. There's not enough beds for people to sleep in to be able to live comfortably here in Canada. But not to worry because the government solution, bring in more people so we have bragging rights of how many people we have which is not a good way of going about things but that's the liberal way so it's poetic because it's dumb and it doesn't make any sense but nonetheless uh we don't have to deal with that too too much longer because justin trudeau is pretty much on par with uh losing the next election especially when you see videos like this come out where he's not looking good i mean i guess technically losing weight is a good thing but He's very skinny, and people are wondering why. Is it cocaine? Is it alcohol? Let's uh, take a look at what he has to say here. Pierre Polyev has been clear. He will cut these investments in Canada's future and cut jobs for Canadian workers because he won't invest in workers and in the future. See, every government, every leader has choices. We've chosen to invest in Canadians, invest in workers, invest in our future. Polyev has chosen to write off Canada's auto sector, to let good middle-class jobs disappear, and to let down Canadian workers. Well, our government will never let that happen. Okay, so one of two things. One, go screw yourself, Justin. We don't like you. We're sick and tired of you. Two, that's very misleading. Saying we're going to invest in Canadians. Why not give Canadians the ability to invest in themselves? I mean, it'd be awesome if Canadians had more money to put in the stock market to get an 8 to 10% return year over year and have their money grow for them. But that's not the case because Justin Trudeau has made sure that any additional income that you could potentially have had here in Canada, you're being taxed. So you are losing on a lot of money because the government has said, we're going to invest for you. We don't think that you're capable of managing your own money. So give us the money and we'll distribute it to everybody evenly. We promise is the famous last words for a trustworthy government. So no longer um, is the liberal government trustworthy. They've sabotaged their own reputation for what I personally think is going to be the next 15 to 20 years. In the past, I've said 10 to 15, but I just think that it's going to take a very long time to fix the economy, get back on track, get out of our massive, insane, insanely large amount of debt and uh, go back to a thriving country. But let me know what you guys think down below in the comments. Next up, we're taking a look at terrorists. Terrorism here in Canada, which is not something you ever really thought would be a problem, but it turns out it is. And we have terrorists, quite a bit of them, 
real freaking terrorists, like people that were in ISIS videos that participated in beheading people overseas or were just there watching it happen, have now come here and they have residency. Like I believe they have Canadian passports, which hey, that's that that can't be good. So of course we're talking about this one right here. The father and son that were linked to a terror plot in Canada, well, it's been escalated and expedited through the chain of command where MPs are actually going to be doing a committee meeting on this issue here. Let's take a look at what uh, the breakdown of this really looks like. TV's Christina Tenalia is following the story for us this morning. So, Christina, what's this meeting focusing on? Yeah, so to be clear, this is a rare summer session in which it is a request to call on ministers to appear to, to essentially grill them, to provide answers as to how the two accused in this case were able to access this country, immigrate here, and the elder of, of the two accused is a Canadian citizen. So it's a meeting to request to compel Public Safety Minister Dominic LeBlanc, Immigration Minister Mark Miller, to have to answer questions. Uh, this is something Prime Minister Justin Trudeau touched on briefly yesterday when he was here in Ontario, that Canadians will have answers on this in time. Uh, Dominic LeBlanc, the Public Safety Minister, uh, essentially saying the same thing recently and saying it would be um, inappropriate to comment at this point or to comment much as there's a criminal investigation underway. Uh, to give you a bit of, of a background here, it was in late July that 62-year-old Ahmed El Didi and his son, 26-year-old Mustafa, were arrested uh, by the RCMP in a group of, uh, I should say a group, a coordinated group of law enforcement. The RCMP spoke at a news conference. The, uh, they have a number of terror-related charges that they're facing. The allegations is that these two were planning a mass casualty terror event, uh, terror attack in Toronto, and that it was imminent, maybe perhaps not in a few hours, but, but close enough, um, and that they were, you know, in a hotel room in Richmond Hill, Ontario, when police busted them. The elder... So the scariest part is that as this story has developed, we have found out that they were aware, they, the government, the government, CSIS and the RCMP were aware that these people had come into Canada and they were observing them and they were watching them go through this entire, you know, plotting of their terror attack. And right before they press the button or we're going to pull the trigger or do whatever it was that they were actually going to do, which again, we ha don't really have the details on that as of right now. Um, that's when they got their doors busted in and it was like, Hey, you're under arrest. We just found out. No, you didn't just find out. Like we've now in the past weeks since this story has gone extremely viral, it's come to light that no nah, the government saw them and they watched and they watched and watched and watched and then acted in the final in the final stages which i don't know to me that seems extremely bizarre i i can like kind of understand the mentality of we need to catch them in the moment of the crime like if someone is thinking about robbing like a gas station unless they actually rob it there hasn't been a crime that's been committed i can kind of get that but the details that haven't really surface as to what the hell it is that they were going to do and why the police why the government waited so long to act that's a little concerning because i mean what if someone blinked a little too hard and poof they disappeared into a different direction like you can lose people in a country mark miller the previous immigration minister somehow lost a million people now he's not a qualified police officer or intelligence officer in fact he's the opposite he lacks intelligence and lacks competence but nonetheless you can still lose people so especially two people in a 40 plus million person country or 30 million or i don't even know how many people we have anymore it's all very confusing we have to ask trudeau and how he identifies on what our population is because it changes it changes day to day it doesn't go down though it just goes up Older Aditi saying his uh, son is innocent, the younger Aditi saying that as well. The concerns surrounding the elder Aditi, uh, Ahmed, it, it has been reported that he was involved in ISIS-related terror violence overseas. So you can recognize not only the concerns of Canadians, but uh, the opposition, the Conservatives are saying, how did this guy not only access this country, how is he a Canadian citizen? Uh, so these are the serious concerns. And what is Ottawa saying? What have we heard from? 
Yeah, defense. so Public Safety Minister Dominic LeBlanc uh, is saying that, you know, there will be, uh, and as well, you know, along with the minister's the immigration minister, a review of the immigration screening process. You know, Marcia, I recently spoke to an expert on extremism uh, about um, some, of, some of the riots that we are seeing in the UK. Uh, and, and what he was saying is, you know, in the UK, there's, there's, this, there's this feeling in terms of, uh, you know, far-right extremists who seem to think that, you know, immigrants can can show up and access the country. And there, there's an element of that when you look at um, refugees or migrants who, who show up on boats uh, seeking asylum. But the, the expert I spoke with said in this country, in Canada, it's far more difficult to immigrate here when you consider even geographically, we're not attached to as many countries. We don't have migrants showing up on boats. And I'm not saying that's what happened in this case here, but certainly uh, ministers are saying, uh, the, the public safety minister, the immigration minister, they're gonna review the immigration and screening process because how did this man who is uh, was apparently involved in ISIS terror violence overseas able to not only immigrate here, go through all the checks and balances invo involved in that, gain access to this country, and he's now a Canadian citizen, Marcia? Yes, and that is what we really need answers on is how the hell did these terrorists go through everything to the point where they were welcomed with passports um, here in Canada and they got to the final stages. Very, very bizarre, but I'd love to know what you guys think down below in the comments. We're going to have to wait and see how the situation unravels, especially with this committee hearing. Next up, we have uh, other frightening statistics. We have uh, Tim Hortons, which is pretty much about to be boycotted here. You have Canada's Temporary Foreign Work Program. As Canadian youth unemployment surges, Bloomberg reports Ontario Tim Hortons hired at least 740 temporary foreign workers in 2023 with 92% of positions listed under holding companies not bearing franchise's name. Why does Tim Hortons not want to hire Canadians? And this is something that can be fact-checked by opening your eyes and going to places like Tim Hortons in Canada. You can just see that there are an increasing number of foreigners and for like immigrants working there right and it's a little concerning because i mean even conservative leader pierre polyev has come out and said look for like we should only really be doing immigration and or foreign workers when there is a position in canada that cannot be filled within a certain amount of time which is yet to be actually defined if i'm not mistaken and then and then if no one wants those jobs or if people just aren't qualified or it's in a small town and people just aren't willing to relocate. Canadians aren't willing to relocate. I don't know what that grace period should be. Three months, six months of the job application um, or the, the, the job posting being open to anybody after three or six months, just in theory is off the top of my head. Then you bring in a foreign worker to fill those positions. And I think that that's a pretty good way to go after immigration of foreign workers right now but let me know what you guys think should it be longer should it be a year two years like how long should employers have to wait before they can bring in foreign workers through the foreign worker program let me know what you guys think down below in the comments it's extremely concerning especially when foreign workers programs is apparently uh being labeled as a breeding ground for contemporary slavery says un report and to that i think most canadians are going to say well if you don't like working here in canada then don't come here and work in canada we should have canadians uh, filling canadian jobs but again let me know what you guys think down below. Now we're getting into the freaky deaky part of this video here. The next pandemic. Is it real? Is it coming? What's it going to look like? Well, Sky News, not too long ago, a couple months ago, said the next pandemic is around the corner. Experts warn, but would lockdowns ever happen again? And we're going to have to wait and see because monkeypox has been on an outbreak, apparently, over the past couple of years since kind of the end of the coup, right? Since that started tapering down. And you can see by this chart here, there's been 1,515 monkeypox, uh, you know, uh, results basically in Canada. Now, this isn't this year. You can see this chart right here. It shows that this is in 2023. 
But the reason we're talking about it is just earlier today, the TPH urges vaccinations for at-risk residents of as monkeypox cases rise. Some of 93 cases have been confirmed this year, a jump from 21 reported cases last year. So it is very much on the rise. In Toronto Public Health, officials are urging people to go and get their shots. And the media has uh, put together a video here, again, kind of doubling down on that narrative, saying, look, it's real, it's coming, it's here, and this could be the next real deal. Moving on to a, another topic we're following really closely this week, uh, the latest with MPOX. We know the World Health Organization watching this closely. They're having a, a meeting tomorrow to talk about this. Can we talk about how this strain has changed a little bit since the original one that was discovered in, in 2022? Yeah, so there's, uh, you know, for, for millennium, MPOX has been in, in uh, primarily in Africa, in parts of West Africa, that's called, just to use the technical, technical term, that's clade two. And then in Central Africa, mostly in the Democratic Republic of Congo, that's clade one. And more recently, they've identified a substrain of clade one. So a, a, basically an offshoot of the type of MPOX that was found in Central Africa. I think it's people are chatting about whether or not this may or may not be more severe or cause more severe illness or may be more readily transmitted. I think it's fair to say that it's premature to have any conclusive statements on the virulence of this particular strain. What is clear, regardless, uh, is that it is spreading. There are many more infections right now in Democratic Republic of Congo and in neighboring countries and countries in the region, including uh, Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi. Uh, so MPOX is a much bigger growing, a, a growing issue in, on the African continent. And of course, we know from many other infections, including COVID, including MPOX in 2022, that we live in a very interconnected world. We saw a very large MPOX outbreak in Canada in 2022, and it has not gone away. Mm -hmm. We still have it here. And given the, the outbreak situation that we are seeing in African countries, is Canada at risk of seeing an outbreak here? What do you think? Well, you know, we already had this outbreak in 2022 and it hasn't gone away. It's grumbling along. So, for example, as of July 13th, 2024, we're just looking at the 2024 calendar year. Ontario had 102 cases of MPOX. Most of them were locally acquired, not brought in from another part of the world. And if you compare that to, with all of 2023, we only had 33 cases. So we have locally acquired MPOX in Ontario. Now, of course, said with with love, respect, uh, no moralization, no value judgments whatsoever. But our outbreak in Ontario has predominantly been in the men who have sex with men community. In fact, over 96% of all of our cases in Ontario have been in men. Uh, so, you know, risk is not equal. And of course, we've had a very large public health response and with leadership from the men who have sex with men community to make sure people are aware of this infection, make sure people know what the risk factors are, uh, lower barriers to vaccines, get the vaccines out there, lower barriers to treatment, and uh, huge kudos to leadership in the uh, men who have sex with men community for informing the community and, and providing better safety to the community. But again, this is an issue that is grumbling along in Ontario and Canada and many places that were previously thought to not be endemic. And it doesn't seem like it's going away, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, vaccines. Uh, vaccines are available for people who would like to protect themselves against MPOX. How do you know how effective the vaccine would be against this this changing strain? And so it's unclear uh, with this particular strain. That's a really good point. And the, all of this is really under investigation. Here's what's likely. The likely scenario is that these vaccines still provide pretty reasonable protection against infection and severe infection if you do have a breakthrough infection. And quite frankly, in Ontario, you know, myself and other people who work in infectious diseases, primary care, emergency medicine, you know, we do see an occasional case of MPOX. And, uh, and, and sometimes these uh, individuals who are infected have been vaccinated, so these are breakthrough infections. But again, what you're going to see is the, the breakthrough infections in a vaccinated individual are far less severe than, ones, uh, than the infections that we saw, for example, before the vaccines were rolled out. Uh, we saw some you know, really sad cases where people were, were miserable and in pain and some individuals were even hospitalized with this. I think that's far less common. And in fact, in the um, 2024 calendar year of, in Ontario, at least with the 102 cases that have been seen to date, there have been zero hospitalizations and zero deaths with those. 
you know, obviously, I think we can improve the vaccine rollout in the those who are at most risk for MPOX, but many of those, many people have received one, preferably two doses of that vaccine, and it does go a long way in preventing infection, but really also mitigating severity of infection if there is a breakthrough. Dr. Isaac Bogosh, thank you so much for sharing your time with And here is where we have a massive issue is I'm not saying that MPOX is going to be the next crazy thing in the world. But if there were to be a virus that does take over the world and have like a 50 percent plus mortality rate, right, and just wipe people out the way the Spanish flu did or the Black Plague or whatever, the people, us people as citizens, aren't really going to have any sort of confidence or faith in the government and these organizations because of the massive hype that they did for the previous thing and what they're trying to do now. And it's all just very annoying and confusing because there are real risks out there and blowing things out of proportion for headlines and to make money and to sell vaccines and all that stuff, which is what Canada's done. I mean, Canada is so committed to vaccines that I think it's in Montreal. They opened up a entire new facility, which albeit is going to create jobs, but it's to produce vaccines which is wild. I don't even know if that's good. I mean, at the time, it seemed really bad because of all the stuff that was happening in the world. But now, maybe planning towards the future, that could be good. I mean, vaccine and vaccines, as long as they've been tested for a very long time, people don't really have an issue with it. It's like the, the new stuff that people have a bit of an issue with. But let me know what you guys think down below in the comments. And now, if MPOX isn't going to take you out, cancer sure as hell will. Global News, or sorry, CTV News, they're all the same thing, is saying global cancer deaths among men are projected to increase by 93% by the year 2050. Holy absolute shit. What the hell is going on, man? This is crazy. Cancer cases and deaths among men are expected to surge by 2050. Uh, with large increases among men age 65 and older. The study projects overall cancer cases among men will increase to 10.3 million in 2022 to 19 million in 2025. That's insane. Countries with a lower income and life expectancy are also projected to see larger increases in cancer deaths in men. Aren't we supposed to solve cancer? Like, wasn't that what Joe Biden said, that he was going to solve cancer? Like, whatever happened to that, right? It's just craziness what's going on. And then when you look at the comments of that original post, you see people saying, of course, we already knew this. And then someone else is saying, I wonder why. And then you're looking at all of these different logos, which we all know what they are. Um, they're all, you know, fast food places. And I mean, yeah, kind of. That, that food is not good for you right it's not good fast food is really really bad for you and it seems like the only way you can really be healthy is if you grow your own food which is something that my wife and i are actually going to be getting into very very soon we're going to be having you know uh, all these planter boxes and going to be filling them with you know berries and, and corn and stuff like that very excited uh to do that and to eventually have a greenhouse and to grow our own food but let me know if you guys are taking any precautions um let me know what you guys think uh, and then now, now we're taking a look at CBC, which is kind of a cannibalistic uh, article. CBC is reporting on themselves <laughs> that they paid out $18.4 million in bonuses in 2024 after eliminated hundreds of jobs. So uh, maybe this is a disgruntled employee who's been a whistleblower, but it's kind of cannibalistic if you think about it, that someone at CBC was paid to expose CBC and all of the bonuses that were <laughs> paid out. That is just absolutely insane. But you can see $3.3 million went to 45 executives and the rest went to 1,200 employees. So that is pretty wild. And uh, we're going to have to wait and see if CBC is even going to be around in five years because Pierre Polyev has promised to defund them. And I think a lot of Canadians are on board with that. So let me know down below if you guys are on board with the CBC being defunded. And ladies and gentlemen, that's where we're going to end this video. On your way out, I would like to encourage you guys to smash the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And we will see you in the next one. Bye for now.